Hi there, and welcome to the second episode of The Telly Show. Last week, I kicked things off with an interview with Bosco, and I got to go behind the scenes of The Toy Show. So yeah, I probably peaked too soon. But however, the show must go on, and I do think we still have a great one in store today. I'm going to be going through my top five TV shows of 2018, which, trust me, was really hard to do. And also, I've got an interview with best-selling author and co-writer of Taken Down, Joe Spain. We wrote this as a close-ended series, as in just a storyline. Right. I mean, that's not to say if we went on that we wouldn't bring characters forward or whatever. Yeah, um, yeah. That's all being talked about. But I mean, I think when viewers watch Sunday's episode, they will, they will have an emotional conclusion. You can see that chat in full in just a few minutes. But first off, as I said, I'm going to be going through my top five TV shows of 2018. It was not an easy task because there has been some fantastic shows this year and TV is just consistently upping its game every year, as you all know. So yeah, it's been hard to pick out my top five. I will have a top 10 list that I'm going to be writing that's going to be going live on entertainment.ie shortly. But here is a sneak peek of the five shows I feel were at the top of their game in 2018. At number five is Bodyguard, a BBC drama that aired early on in the year and fast became their most watched drama in over 10 years. It was my first time seeing Richard Madden in anything since Game of Thrones, where he played Rob Stark. And as much as that role probably did wonders for his career, this role is no doubt going to send it skyrocketing. There's even talk from playing Bond in the aftermath. He plays Police Sergeant David Budd, a war veteran assigned to protect Home Secretary Julia Montague, whose politics stand for everything he despises. The series is as gripping as it gets, with an opening 20 minutes that will leave you hooked. Sure, some of it might be really unbelievable, but when has that ever stopped a show from being good? At number four is Derry Girls. This Channel 4 comedy aired early in 2018 and really took us all out of our post-Christmas gloom. It follows the lives of four teenage girls, and of course the wee English fella, who are navigating their way through their teens in early 1990s Northern Ireland at the height of the Troubles. The show is a really sharp script written by Lisa McGee with characters that are both hilarious and charming in equal measure. Derry Girls is back for more in the new year and we can't wait. At number three is The Handmaid's Tale. Now, unlike Dairy Girls, this show certainly isn't any antidote to gloom. However, it is still one of the standout seasons of television of 2018. The story moved away from the books for its second outing, which some fans weren't happy about, but while it's still hard going, this dystopian drama about a world where women no longer have any rights seems both timely and relevant. Season three is on the way next year, and with Margaret Atwood just announcing another novel is also on the way, there could be plenty more of The Handmaid's Tale after that. If we can handle it. At number two is Killing Eve. Now, as soon as I heard that this show was written by Phoebe Waller-Bridge, I was all over it. If you haven't seen her BBC show Fleabag yet, you need to get on it. Phoebe Waller-Bridge is one seriously talented actress and writer and is responsible for a lot of great TV at the moment. It sees MI5 security officer Eve Pilastri, played by Sandra Oh, going up against a psychopathic assassin, played by Jodie Comer. The two ladies are fantastic in their respective roles, and this show is filled with as much humour as there are nail-biting moments. Despite the dark subject matter, Killing Eve is a lot of fun and a really, really worthy contender for show of the year. At number one, my favourite show of 2018 is The Haunting of Hill House on Netflix. Now, if somebody had told me six months ago that The Haunting of Hill House would be my number one show of the year, I genuinely wouldn't have believed them. First of all, I don't even like horror that much, but this show is far more than that. It's loosely based on the iconic book of the same name by Shirley Jackson and was adapted and directed here by Mike Flanagan. It follows the stories of the Crane family and shifts perspective from their times as children living in the Haunted Hill House to their adult lives where they're still deeply impacted by what happened. The reason The Haunting of Hill House is my show of the year is that it's far more than just a few frights. Even though it is a really incredibly well-paced horror with some fantastic jump scares in there, really and truly. But as well as that, it's also a show about family and about grief and all the different kinds of ghosts we can all walk around with every day. It really did scare me and I did have so many nightmares about it, but it actually was worth it because as well as all that, the show actually packs a real emotional punch as well and it stuck with me long after the credits rolled. So there you have it. They are my top five TV shows of 2018. Please do let me know if you've watched them, if you agree with what I think, or if you don't agree, then just let me know, but in a nice way, you know, be sound. 
The big interview this week is with Joe Spain, who is the co-writer of RTE's Taken Down, along with Stuart Carolyn. Taken Down's finale takes place this Sunday, but you can also catch up with the whole thing on the RTE player. Joe is also a crime fiction author who, as well as a successful TV series, also had a number one bestseller earlier this year with The Confession, and has plenty more books and TV shows on the way. In short, she is one seriously impressive lady. Joe Spain, thank you so much for coming in to us today. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for inviting me. Um, I have a huge question to begin with um, because I was reading all about you recently and I want to know, first off, how you went from being almost a TD to a political advisor to a best-selling novelist to now a writer for um, RT's biggest show of the year, Taken Down. So I'm pretty much just going to leave that with you, Joe, now and you can answer <laughs> in whatever order you want. That's um, where to begin. <laughs> yeah. So I suppose, um, initially, how did you end up going from politics to becoming an author? Um, for me, anyway, in terms of what I was doing in politics, it's all quite linked because I was writing and right, I loved yeah. writing. And that's why I didn't want to stand for election again, because actually I like kind of being behind the camera as opposed to in front of the camera, which I'm doing now. Yeah, yeah. Um, Sorry. And I like the, I know, <laughs> We've got, we got to do PR, we've got to do PR for yeah, the show. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I liked in the policy end of things. And I once I started working in Leinster House, I mean, I'd be writing all day, every day for maybe 12 hours a day. So I've always been a writer. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I really, my other love has always been crime fiction. So when I was growing up, I read crime fiction. I watched crime fiction. Like I was big into all the Agatha Christie's and I used to read every book I could lay my hand on that was crime fiction. So I was nursing this little kind of hope. And I think at one point I realised I, I am a good writer. I mean, you have to, to communicate politics, you have to be a good writer. Particularly, you know, if you're doing people's speeches or whatever, you have to be able to help them convey the policies of what they're saying. Mm. And I started writing this novel. And around the same time, my husband had lost his job. I was the only income earner and we've got like quite a big family. And I was like, what could I do to kind of like earn a bit more money? What if I could turn these words into paid money? So I wrote this book in kind of a mad vein. <laughs> Like, who writes a book tearing money like it? Yeah. <laughs> I, I said, I sounds, it sounds crazy. Like, this all works. Stay yeah. with me. Stay with me. Yeah, I think it's like some kind uh, of belief yeah, that it would work. Um, yeah. And I sent it into Richard and Judy competition and oh, it yes. was selected. Yeah, it got and into it was, the shortlist, didn't it? It got shortlisted. There were seven of us and like thousands and thousands of entries. And then I kind of thought, okay, this is going to change my life. Like, and it did because on the day they decided the winner, um, they hadn't picked a genre for the competition. So they went kind of with an historical romance novel. But the publishers rang me up and said, we love crime. I mean, they published Steve Larson and all manner of crime authors mm. that you know. And they said, we want to give you a two book deal. So I went from like, I'd never submitted to a publisher. I'd never submitted to an agent. Um, and they gave me a two book deal straight away. Amazing. And um, fairly shortly after that, I left my full time job. <laughs> yeah, I'd say you'd have to. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. I was kind of like, I, I always say to people, it's like starting up a small business. I had to decide to kind of grab this mm. and do it and take the chance. And given that I had wanted to be a writer since I was a kid, there was no real option, you know. Yeah. But yeah. we did have four children at the time and yeah. I was a breadwinner. So it was a. Because it, you, the first book was 2015, was it? Yeah. And so, yeah, you've had four kids and it's. One of those things where I'm always like, oh, I don't have time to do any writing outside of the job. And then yeah. I'm reading about you and I'm like, you've got four kids and, you know, you've managed to get a book out pretty much almost every year for the last few years. Yeah. Maybe more than that. <laughs> I, I <laughs> what have, is your um, secret, Joe? <laughs> the, I, I am a very fast writer. And yeah, that is yeah. one of the things you learn. Um, I've done a little bit of journalism as well and I learned two things. You hook the reader straight away. Um, and then you write fast. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, some writers, like, we're all different. Some writers will take two, three years to produce kind of like their masterpiece. I'm yeah. probably a much more commercial writer. Yeah. Um, so I write two books a year. I write my detective series. Mm -hmm. And then I write these standalone psychological thrillers. So I have two out this year. Yeah. I have two out next year. I have two out the following year. You know, there I'm, I work ahead of deadlines. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I write the first draft in four weeks. And Amazing. then I edit. Like, and it's kind of the Stephen King mentality if you get it down. Yeah. Then you go back and have a look at it, you know. Yeah. Um, and now I'm doing the TV as well. Yeah. And yeah. so Taken Down, um, how did that happen? And how did you find yourself working with Stuart Carolyn? Um, I, last year, um, Ortiz Jane Gogan had read the books and she, she really liked the writing. And she came to me and said, um, you know, have you ever thought about adapting your books? Have you any original ideas? And she was really kind of encouraging and supportive. Mm. And I said, I do have this original idea. And she just kind of nurtured that. And I'd known Stuart for a couple of years. 
um, I'd asked him, he's, he's a celebrity as far as I was concerned. He's yeah, a celebrity. Yeah. Where I, I absolutely loved Love Hate. Yeah, me um, too. And I'd always had this thing like, I'll work with Stuart Carolyn someday, you yeah, know, whether yeah. maybe he'll just be adapting books, you know. Um, so I told him that RT were interested and I had particularly an idea around direct provision. Mm. And Stuart has like really good politics as well. And he's in, I think this could be really good. Um, so he, I'd only written novels and he'd done the screen and there's a big leap yeah, from novels yeah. to screen. Um, so he was kind of like going, he was mentoring me through that process, you know, how you move from, because novels are big bulky things and screen is like scalpel writing. You have to strip everything back and it has to move at a pace. So he was guiding me through that. And the timeline we did it in, he was like, two of us had to do it together. You couldn't have done it on your own anyway. Mm. So we just started co-writing it together. Yeah. And yeah, as you're saying, like it must be, you know, a different kind of mindset. I know you're going to be writing more TV now to switch from, yeah. you know, writing dialogue to writing, describing a whole entire scene as you would in a novel. Yeah. And, and are you finding that easier and easier as time goes on to adjust to that type of writing? It is. Yeah. It's like anything like practice yeah. makes perfect. Um, I'm doing a lot of episodic work now around Europe Yeah. Um, and pitching for new shows. And it's one of those things like a novel now I can just... I'm not saying I do them in my sleep, but there there is a way of writing a novel. There's a structure to it and it's the same, mm. like there's a DNA to an episode. I mean, you're always learning, like I'll be learning for screen for as long as, I mean, I think David Simon says that he's still learning yeah, in his writing, yeah. you know. Um, so and I think it's a good place to be because if you get to the point where you think you know everything, then yeah. you're going to lose your audience and your readers, you know. Yeah. Um, but when you surround yourself with good people, and they're kind of pointing out to you the things you need to learn. And I'm very good at being edited because, I mean, I'm edited from one end of the year to the next and I'm married to an editor as well. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <it laughs> um, used to, but it, but yeah. it is like you do get better and get quicker. And the, the thing with TV writing is just to be able to do it quickly. Yeah. And with Taken Down then, um, how have you found the reaction to the show? We're heading to the finale now on Sunday. Yeah. Um, I don't want you to give too much away, but I may ask you a little bit about it. Um, but it's really struck quite a chord with people. The fact yeah. that you're dealing with something like direct provision and, you know, people might have known about it before, but never really seen it dramatised in this way in Ireland before. Yeah, I, I've i always thought that this is the most wonderful thing about drama because you can take like in all of my novels, um, I mean, I say I'm commercial as in they sell, <laughs> yeah. but I, I'm not writing like kind of the Jack Reacher type. Um, there's a body, there's action, there's shooting, you know, yeah. every book has got like a kind of social or historical or political sub team. Mm. And it was the same with Taken Down. If you're going to do a story, I mean, you can do plots, you can do kind of the Midsummer Murders type plots and it's just a body and there's a detective and a solve. Or you can do it with a bit of depth. And I knew um, when I started looking into direct provision, and trafficking and what goes on in the country like that was the story that I wanted to tell um it's the reaction to it has been like on the one hand phenomenal like for me especially although I, I've kind of made a decision to not to stop watching my own tv that I write because it's, it's weird like I don't read my own books yeah, yeah. <laughs> when your tv show comes on you're watching it and then I'm watching it on twitter as well via yeah the reaction people. especially yeah. with the way it's on RT that time yeah, slot yeah. like a frame which gets everyone involved yeah. talking about it and you do and, and there's a huge positivity for it I think mm, um, and, but there's also the other side and to be honest the other side doesn't bother me so much like there's a lot of I get trolled by a lot of racists and I'm, I'm I'm muting every week. It doesn't bother me because I can just mute them. And it occurred to me like I had I'd an incident recently where I was with somebody and to all intents and purposes was the nicest person in the world, but was an out and out racist. And in a very insidious way, kept kind of referring to people like it was us and them. So right. she immediately assumed because I was white and Irish that I was with her on this. Um, and I thought, you know, it's easy for me to do this because when I walk around the street, like I'm not noticeably different to anybody. Yeah. So, OK, I choose to go on Twitter and people might, you know, tag me in things and say nasty things, but I can just mute them, you know. And then when I go to the shops, I'm, I'm not having to deal with this on a day to day basis, mm. which is what people who are actually suffering from racism have to suffer with, you know. So when we decided to make the show, I was like, if we, if we start a conversation on this or have anybody talking about it and everybody from like David Caffrey, who directed it and Stuart, um, Suzanne McCauley, the executive producer and, and then James involved as well, we were all pulling the same way and we were saying like, if we can make people talk about this, then, you know, depend, maybe nobody will watch it. We don't know. You can never tell, mm. but we'll have done a good job and we'll all feel good about it. Yeah, exactly. And how much research did you do in terms of like, you know, direct provision centres, looking into sex trafficking, how much sort of, how in kind of grained and all that <laughs> did you have to get, you know? Was it? Well, 
I didn't go the full, um, who's the guy who met at that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Daniel Daly was famous. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but extensive research. And I mean, my background as well meant we were always going to, like, that's how my brain works. Yeah, yeah. And um, it was harder than, I kind of suspected it was going to be hard um, yeah. because even to get into direct provision centres. Um, I've, I've always mentioned one that I went to because it's it's okay. I went to Mosney, which is one of the better ones. Yes, yeah. Can't really talk about the other ones that I saw. Um, and I, I spoke to a lot of people in direct vision. And again, there's some people who are in direct vision who are on the show and they're happy to talk about it. Most of them are at the other side. The people who are in direct vision are like, okay, I'll tell you these stories, but please don't ever mention my name because yeah, yeah. I don't want the manager to know that I was talking to you. You know, things like that. And yeah. it's just... Like, it was an eye-opener for me. The last time I'd been in Mosny was when it was a holiday camp. Yeah. Same. So I was driving down this road and, like, the first thing I taught, like, a couple of years ago, it's not comparable in the slightest, but a couple of years ago I was in Auschwitz. And it's the kind of modular home thing. And and as far as the eye can see. And it was a really kind of, it was a winter's day and it was really grey. And I was looking out over this and thinking, like, it, you feel that the fun is being sapped and you go in and um, when I was there anyway, they were doing a new playground for the kids. So the, the old one was kind of like railed off. Mm. And I was thinking, I understand the mentality here in terms of like if people come to the country seeking asylum and you've got to process them. So I understand the whole, you know, OK, there's somewhere for you to stay while we process your application. But it's the length of time that people are forced to stay in the places and the different kind of rules and routines that are placed upon them, like the curfew. Some of the Mosny is one of the better ones because they can cook, but a lot of them are in hotels mm. and they're down in that canteen facility all the time, you know. And you realise kind of the limitations and the, the institutionalisation that they live with for years on end. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, it's just not good enough. Like, yeah. it's just not good enough. I mean, whatever your asylum policy is, and I know I'm just back from Denmark and they, they're, they're bad as well. They just tend to send people home. So there's no right or wrong way. But I always think if you start with the position of somebody is a human being, and particularly the children, because one third of everybody in direct vision is children. And if you started that position, it's very hard to justify then a policy that creates direct vision. Yeah, absolutely. I and went on quite a long time, but I'm passionate no, about it. You know, no, so, yeah. yeah, but it, as the show in itself, I mean, it's people are having these conversations now, which is great. And there's yeah. so many people even who didn't know even about direct vision and that, or sort of knew of it in sort of some kind of you know outskirts of their mind way but not realizing and even watching the show um you know the mother in it saying like oh you can't cook I can't cook food I can't like yeah. look after my kids in the same way that I would like to look after my kids yeah. and um the actors in it are phenomenal as well who play those roles because it's you're so so involved in their story now yeah. um and one actually actor I wanted to talk to you about was the guy who plays Gar who yeah. is Jeez, like they're Walmart. all phenomenal but he actually makes my skin crawl and I really need to know that that actor is a lovely person. <laughs> sure, he is the nicest man. I, the first time I met him, I knew him from Love Hate. Like, yeah, because he was getting Love Hate, yeah. wasn't he? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're, we're not story casting him. <laughs> no, no, yeah. Oh, is this a no, because I actually, I nearly couldn't <laughs> think of it for ages how I recognised him. And then I was like, oh, he was Git. He was the guy yeah, they murdered, yeah. wasn't he? And, yeah. But, yeah, but he's he's absolutely, he's, he's the nicest person in the entire world. Yeah. Um, and that made it all the more shocking when we were doing the read through and I just watched how seamlessly he slipped into this character. And this is when you know that somebody is an amazing actor. Yeah. Um, but I have a great story about Jimmy Smallhorn because when I pulled up for the second read through, we were at some hotel in Santry and um, I was pulling into this kind of driving behind this car, following him and the car in front of me realised at some point he'd gone the wrong way and just started reversing. Um, into me <laughs> so <laughs> waiting 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 and then I kind of started banging on the horn and he literally like you know I think he touched the, the front of the car and stopped so I pulled back a bit and he and it was him and he was driving the guy who plays Toby Oh, yeah, I just rolled yeah. down the window and I was like, do you want a six episode? Because <laughs> he hadn't actually written the six episode at that stage. I'm yeah. so sorry. <laughs> and he said, I didn't even see, I didn't even see, you know. And I was like, so you try to kill people in real life too. Is this, like, <laughs> this your, your MO? Like, yeah, yeah. Um, but he's he's really, really intelligent and really smart and yeah. a total gentleman. Really? Because it's yeah. watching him on screen, like it just it feels like he could be giving you, you know, a piece of cake in one hand and then stabbing you in the neck at the other. Like, I know. And delivering. what he I does know. it. And that's why you're sort yeah. of almost at ease when you're watching him yeah. and you're like this guy isn't so bad and then he does something and you just feel like more and more his character now I don't know yeah. um, if there's much talk of season two at the moment is there or is there anything confirmed mm. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know I, I'm only concentrating on this one yeah, um, yeah. because this and, and I'm, I'm new to the industry so I yeah. you know 
this is the story I wanted to tell. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we'll see um, what happens. No, because the only reason I was saying that was because it would be great to see more of his character. Um, but at the same time, I also want bad things to happen to him because he's a horrible human being. <laughs> you know, I want I want there to be justice for Esme. Yeah. And I know you probably don't want to give too much away about the finale, but um, is there anything you could tell us maybe? that <laughs> um, Will there be it's, it's, closure it's for fans with it? Or, <laughs> it's on on Sunday. Great, okay. Yeah. Um, there will, I mean, um, this... We wrote this as a close-ended series, as in just the storyline. Right. I mean, that's not to say if we went on that we wouldn't bring characters forward or whatever. Yeah, um, yeah. That's all being talked about. But I mean, I think when viewers watch Sunday's episode, they will they will have an emotional conclusion. Great. Yeah, yeah. Which is what you need, you know. Yeah, um, definitely. And it like as you know, it would be great to see these characters develop further in another season. But yeah, it is good that there's not going to be a cliffhanger, thankfully. <laughs> or, or maybe there will be. Maybe I'm completely pulling the wool over your eyes. <laughs> I see what you're doing. I've been well briefed <laughs> in terms of what you know. It's 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 complicated for me. Normally, when I'm talking about works, there are books that I've already finished and they're done. Yeah, yeah. So I've never had to do an interview in the middle of a novel. Like, how are you going to write that final yeah, chapter? Yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, so TV for me is new. So I'm, I'm you have to be so cagey about it. Yeah. 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 yeah, And there's more TV on the way for you now. You're um, traveling around a bit. I don't know. You can't tell me too much, I'm sure, about that <laughs> either. But yeah. still, exciting times ahead um, with new projects. Yeah. Um, I mean, we're doing, I'm doing a show in Denmark at the moment that seems to be going ahead. Um, like all these things can just fall apart to the moms notice. That's the other thing I'm learning about TV. Generally, books, when they pay you to do the book, you write the book, it goes on the shelves. With TV, you can get so far with it and then a broadcaster can pull out or production money doesn't come true or yeah, something yeah. happens. Um, the De- one in Denmark seems to be going ahead. Um, there's one in Finland that I'm co-writing wow, on. Yeah. Looking at one in Norway um, and my Tom books are being adapted, my Tom Reynolds series. This is, yeah, your main inspector. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I will possibly be adapting them myself for the production company because now I know how much of those books I have to lose. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a big thing for an author, you know. Um, I'm on the other side of the, I'm on both sides, like I'm the poacher and the gamekeeper now. So yeah. I'm looking at my own books going, oh, it's 300 pages there that can go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> most authors are like, every word is important, you know. So yeah. I've made the leap. Great. Well, yeah. like amazing times ahead and best of luck with it all. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming in. <laughs> Thanks very much. So there you have it. That was the second episode of The Telly Show. I hope you enjoyed. Next week, I'm going to be talking to the absolute legend that is Pat Short, who, as well as being an incredibly talented actor, it'll be no surprise to you that he's also an absolute gent. As well as that, I'm going to be heading out to Orte to give you the first look of the new set of Fair City. So it's all go. Don't miss it.